and so on, the, the, the gold and the silver and all the treasures, are used to build the temple. So that the Israelites have, have looted Egypt when they go they forth, and, and they take that and they, they contribute that in order to build the tabernacle. David has won uh, victories over all his enemies round about, and he has gathered all of these precious metals and all these building materials. And what he does is he, he devotes the fruit of his cultural victories to the building of, of the cultic place. And, and, uh, all right, so there's this primacy then of, of, uh, of, of priesthood. And that's normal. That's the way it should be. And I try to point out on page 56 uh, how... A ancient uh, pagan religion uh, was the exact opposite. Instead of having culture as subordinate to cult, uh, in the uh, pagan religion, Baalism and so on, the, the way they conceived of, of the whole thing was that the cult was serving fertility purposes. You engaged in, in the cult <coughs> in, in order to manipulate the situation so that you would be culturally well off, so that you would increase in family and field and flock. That's the purpose of, of the cult there. So, so that so their cult is subservient to culture, especially to uh, cultural abundance, as I said, which is a turning upside down of the way uh, things should be. And the health, wealth, gospel that we, uh, we hear in our day is simply another version of turning things all upside down, where the, the, the worship of, of the Lord becomes a big uh, motivation for that, is so that you can uh, enjoy uh, a long uh, life and good health and, and, and a big bank account. And uh, that's a total warping, then, of what true religion and undefiled should be all about. We move on. Chapter 4. I won't pause for questions because I, if it's like the one on the Sabbath, we wouldn't get to chapter four. All right. <clears throat> now, in the treaty form, then we discussed uh, what would have been the preamble, the titles of uh, the Lord, the, the historical prologue, the benefits he had bestowed, the image of God, the kingdom of God, and uh, the stipulations of the covenant, cultural and, and, and cultic uh, alike. Then, of course, then there were the curses and the blessings, the sanctions of the covenant, and we have equivalent of, of those in, in God's covenant with uh, man, this covenant of works with Adam from the beginning. Now, how much detail? Trying to make some headway here. All right. We're looking for the material within these early chapters that would convey God's promises of blessing or his threats of, uh, of, uh, of curse. And for one thing, in this opening paragraph, I tried to say that uh, already in the way in which man is created in the image of God <clears throat> and in the likeness of this glory spirit who is standing um, before him, uh, in, in this very fact, there is the, the promise uh, of, of some of the blessing sanctions of, of the covenant, and, <clears throat> and quite specifically, indeed, the, the thought that uh, ultimately there would be an, an advance uh, in the form of glorification. We analyze the image of God in terms of the three components. The, the one, dominion over the world. The second, uh, moral excellence. And the, the third, uh, which Adam and Eve did not yet have, but which was a prospect uh, held out before them, uh, was uh, ultimate glorification. That was the this e this eternal life, that this the physical glorification, was a, a, a blessing sanction that was held out before him, and then so that was built into his very nature as the image of God. Uh, the, 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 the longing for this, for this complete likeness to the glory spirit here, the glory spirit including this this visual luminosity, and and so man is has this inbuilt yearning to be thus advanced in his total likeness to God so as to in incorporate along with his dominion and moral excellence uh, this stage of, of glorification whereby the division of the cosmos into upper register invisible to man and lower register visible to him would be obliterated and, and now man has access into the totality of, uh, of the, the, the creation including all of its glory dimensions which presently he doesn't have access to. The hope for that 
was built into his very nature, his image of God, and particularly uh, as he looked at the theophanic presence of God, the glory spirit, uh, uh, who is the archetype uh, uh, for that. So this is not just some tacked on promise uh, that could or not have uh, uh, not been made. It was uh, something that was uh, built into man in the, in the very way in which he was made. Not, not to realize that just to continue him as he was would have been a curse and, and not, not a, a blessing at all because it would have frustrated the, the deepest longings of his soul for uh, ult ultimate uh, uh, godlikeness possible to a creature. But now in, in addition to that, of course, the, the, uh, the, the blessing sanctions came to expression in, in well, the Sabbath, all right? We've, we covered that. We said that from God to man, uh, the Sabbath was precisely this. It was a, it was a, a formulation of, of the blessing sanction of, of the covenant that you, in the way of covenant obedience, uh, will attain at last uh, uh, to the, the, the heavenly Sabbath. And uh, in, in effect, it also included the idea that uh, uh, the mandate to you to, to fill the earth and, and to subdue it will at last be completed. And, and uh, so uh, the Sabbath promise is, uh, is a promise uh, then not just of the perfecting of the image of, of God within man, but uh, also the, the promise that the historical task, the cultural task, would come uh, to uh, a, a complete expression with, with the ultimate uh, the dominion that the man might ever enjoy uh, over all of the creation. Then thirdly, uh, there is the, the special tree of, of life and uh, so please then you, you can read in pages 58 and 59 and so on. I'm trying to say there, just summing it up quickly. Uh, here in the midst of the, the garden, along with the probation tree of uh, knowledge of good and evil, uh, in, in the midst of the, the garden is, is the, the tree of life. It is not the, the fruit of, uh, it is not the tree of the forbidden fruit. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is the tree of the forbidden fruit. On the other hand, uh, this particular tree is... Uh, and it's the tree of the reserved fruit. It wasn't totally forbidden, but the time for enjoying it was not yet. <coughs> uh, this is a tree that was made available uh, for use on the far end of a successful probation. Once you were beyond probation, by virtue of fulfilling that guardianship of the garden against the satanic intruder, once you were beyond the, the probation, and, and, and you had earned the reward, and then you would have a right of access to this tree of life, and it would then would have served, you might say, a sort of a, a, a sacramental means of, of God's bestowing uh, on mankind of the, the benefits, uh, the, the rewards that he would have, uh, have earned. And in, in terms, well, we, we spoke about the, not just the forensic aspect of the, the, the approbation, justification, and so on, but also the, 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 the inward uh, ontological changes, uh, the confirmation in, in, in righteousness, holding this love of the truth, the eternal life, the, the fixed permanent uh, spiritual uh, status beyond fall and, and, and so on, the, the, the tree of life uh, would have uh, signified that. So what we're saying then is that the tree of life did not just uh, signify the, the kind of life that man had from the creation onward as it was, but it signifies uh, that eternal life that he uh, should have access to if he passed the probation. And that's why this tree of life uh, appears uh, then in connection with the outcome and with the consequences of, of the probation, that having failed the probation, now he doesn't have access to the tree, and God sets up the cherubim around it to, to guard it, lest the uh, Adam, now undeserving, should uh, uh, try to uh, have access uh, uh, to that particular tree. Elsewhere in the Bible, as, as we come to the, the actual heaven, the consummation, the, the final thing, uh, where eternal life is enjoyed for forever, there again, the, the tree of life emerges with the river of life and so on, with the mountain of God as, as part of uh, that whole eschatological picture. So this tree of life in the garden, then, is a tree of the eschatological attainment of life of of the, of the uh, eternal life. And another of, of the ways in which then God uh, conveyed to, to mankind the, the happy outcomes, the, the blessing sanctions of a successful probation. On the other hand, in the day you eat thereof, you will surely die. So uh, the blessing sanctions were symbolized, uh, the curse sanction is verbalized in the day you eat thereof. 
you will uh, die. What kind of death? Uh, and uh, perhaps we think of physical death, but I don't think that's the point here. Uh, physical death enters the picture only after the fall. There's, there's rhyme and reason for, for the dissolution of body and soul, physical death, uh, only after the, the fall. Now here, just in terms of the thing, right, just in terms of the covenant of creation, the only options really were heaven and hell. And, uh, no halfway uh, steps in here. If you uh, uh, obey the, the covenant, uh, then heaven is, is uh, yours. Uh, life, eternal life. Uh, a life in the presence of God, because that's what life genuinely consists of, in, in, in the presence of, uh, of God. Uh, the tree of life is there where God is present, you see, in the garden. But uh, then the opposite, the, in terms of this covenant, the opposite is simply that if you fail here, then, you know, there, there is no intimation given beforehand of, of redemption and of common grace and of all of these other things uh, and, and the common curse. Uh, no, it, it's just the, the one option or, or the other is all that's held out beforehand. And uh, so it was heaven or, or hell. And what is hell? Uh, hell is not physical death. In, in fact, uh, in terms of redemptive history, uh, those who have physically died have to undergo a physical resurrection in order to enter into hell, which is an amazing thing. You know, uh, uh, don't know how to, what to make of it. Is that, you know that, that God is engaged not just in the resurrection of the redeemed, but he, he's engaged in a general resurrection of, of the wicked, and for what purpose? Uh, to cast them in, in, into hell. Uh, they, uh, my mind sort of balks at that, the, the thought, but nevertheless, this is the way uh, that the Bible portrays it. But, but hell, then, does not involve physical uh, that It's an embodied experience in, in hell, and there'd be no room for what we know as, as physical death, uh, no purpose for it, in terms of the original uh, covenant of creation. So that they were being threatened in the day you will eat thereof, you will just perish because you will be cast out from the presence of God for forever, period. And that's it. Now, after the fall, and God's purpose being one of redemption, and he uh, therefore wants to create a, an historical space within which the redemption can work its way out, and so he puts a, a, a clamp on the expression of his wrath, so it isn't the ultimate curse that he visits upon the earth, but it's only a, a, a common curse uh, which uh, uh, slows down history and so on, but which involves, as we'll be seeing, especially the dust unto dust. Uh, see, now there's a place for physical death as a, a temporary halfway stage for all, all kinds of purposes that one can think of. Uh, uh, but as, as a temporary experience, which, as we said, you have to be delivered from in order to, in the, the case of the reprobation, the cash accidents and health later on. So physical death uh, is not what is in view here, but it's uh, a heaven and hell, uh, uh, what is being portrayed. So what we're talking about here is is a sort of biblical prophecy, is it not? Mm -hmm. Later on, when we study the prophets, uh, that's fundamentally what they are they are doing. They they are they declare all the aspects of the covenant, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and all the others. But they they, they take up uh, who is the God of the covenant, what He's done for them, and what He's required of them. But but the center of gravity of the prophetic message later on is the sanctions of the covenant, the curses and, and the blessings. And that goes right back here to the, the original prophet, the Lord himself, who is more than a prophet. He, what he is saying, he's decreeing things, but nevertheless his words have this prophetic character to them. And so this original divine prophecy consists precisely in the articulation of the, of the, the covenant sanctions, tree of life, uh, the, the threat of uh, death. Now then, that it sets up the, the uh, probationary situation. And, uh, but meanwhile, I think I would like to just expand a little bit on, on uh, this, this concept of, uh, of the blessing sanctions and how, how they would have worked their, their way out. Do I have five minutes? Um, just about, maybe. When we were discussing the whole structure of the, the covenants, I think I did something like uh, this, but it won't hurt then to uh, 
uh, do it again. We, we spoke about this covenant as being uh, God's covenant that works with Adam. And it had these uh, two phases, the probation phase, and then uh, I think we called it the conferral phase. So uh, let's divide things uh, that way. And uh, so there is the probation phase, and then there is the conferral. And it says we work this out in a little more detail, we'll get a little more specific concrete uh, concept of uh, for what the whole history of mankind would have been like in, as the, the consequence of a successful uh, probation. And uh, we divided the conferral phase into two stages, the one of confirmation and the other consummation. All right, the probation uh, phase, it has a cultic focus. This is what we've been saying about priesthood and about the primary task of man from the beginning was as the guardian of the garden, so it had a cultic focus. After a successful probation, we'll find out then uh, that uh, would have been, the, the distinctive emphasis here would have been not cultic focus, uh, but cultural fullness. So I think these uh, two areas uh, sort of uh, characterize the, the uh, two phases. During the, uh, the first stage, then there's a, a cultic focus. There's this probation to be passed. It involves the idea of the sanctification of the garden, the guardianship as we said of, of the garden. It's the idea of our, our Armageddon here. It's, it's the fighting the battle of Armageddon, protecting the, the holy site of God. And uh, in, in uh, that connection, then there's the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which we want to speak more about, and, and uh, which brings out, again, this guardianship focus, and especially the fact that, that Satan's going to come, and uh, that the guardianship function, it will take the form of, of judging uh, him. And so the thought of judgment, huh? In, in the eschatology of the original covenant of creation, judgment, which we think of as occupying a sort of an end point in, in, in history as it does under redemption, but under the original thing, judgment would have taken place at the beginning of history as the first step. It would have changed the whole character of history from that point on, from what we know, but judgment, the judgment you see of Satan, which is the final stage, final battle of Armageddon, now that should, that should have taken place right away. Slay the dragon. Hmm? All right. That, that, that was the, the first phase, that, that was uh, the probation phase. Now what we're trying to get at that at the moment is to try to get, give some particular color to the concept of, of, of the reward who would involve then an analysis of, 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 of this. And so during this stage then of uh, cultural fullness, you have that mandate to, to fill the earth and to subdue it. So achieving, moving out expansion from the Garden of Eden to occupy the, the whole globe. Huh? So global expansion would be the thought involving population, multiplying, occupying, expansion, appropriation, subjugation, cultivation. All of these things in order to achieve the cultural program, which then can be thought of in terms of the model of the city. The city of God theocratic city, the, the building of that is what's going on uh, here, uh, or the house of God, same thing, just different models uh, to present the, 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 the cultural <coughs> enterprise. So you, you work at this thing until the city of God is a big city, mega, uh, mega polis. Uh, the, the big holy city, that, that was the the goal of the, the cultural mandate so far as mankind himself could uh, carry it out during uh, this particular stage. And then the Holy Spirit who created him in the image of God here at the beginning, the Holy Spirit who worked within him so that he'd be confirmed in eternal life, that Holy Spirit, that glory spirit would work again within him now to, to glorify him physically, and so now we have physical glorification.
of the, of the people as individuals are describing it in terms of, of what they have meanwhile built, namely the city of God. Mankind would have carried it that far, but no farther. He couldn't achieve the ultimate, the ultimate culture. Heaven is the ultimate culture. God is the only one that can establish that culture. It's been there from the beginning, and at the end of human history, the Holy Spirit would so glorify man that he could participate in, in fact, himself become part of that city of, of, of God. And uh, so it's the beyond, the meta city. Huh? Man can build a big city, only God can produce the meta, the beyond city, beyond all human culture, the, the, the heavenly city. Well, our, our time is more than enough that I try to fill in that general sketch when we return, Lord willing, tomorrow. Meeting uh, on Wednesday. Uh, the schedule then for today, as you know, is two hours this morning, one this afternoon. Likewise, for April 15th and, and uh, 16th, there will be uh, uh, the two hours in the morning and the one in the afternoon on the 16th, which is also the uh, hour when you'll have your exam on the uh, documentary hypothesis business. Then, the following two weeks uh, will involve the extra hour on one on stage at a time, not the, the full stage of glorification, <coughs> but first the, the inward confirmation in everlasting uh, life. So in connection with this, the tree of the knowledge of uh, good and evil would have its place. Then on the occasion of a successful probation, uh, the tree of life would function as sort of a a sacramental means whereby uh, then the Lord, by His Spirit, conferred upon man eternal life, confirmation, stability, permanence in, in uh, holiness, righteousness, love, and the truth, no longer able to sin, and, and so forth. And uh, so that would have characterized man from this point on, and yet not immediately be the end of, of, uh, of uh, this pre-consummation history, uh, because although the cultic task would have been accomplished, there was still that whole cultural task that we talked about, the being fruitful, multiply, build the, the earth, uh, and, and so on. The kingdom commission, the, the commission to build the city of God, the kingdom of God, the holy the temple city of God, that, that still remained to be done generation after generation, multiplying, filling the earth. Uh, the, uh, the, the history would not have been the way it has been since the fall, which is... Uh, uh, sort of a movement of man out from his uh, uh, settled rootage uh, there in Eden uh, into something which has become a, a, a wilderness so that man's uh, history is a, a trek out into the, the, the wild, uh, on track wilderness without the, the, the uh, guaranteed protection of God at all points and so on. That's the way it has been. Uh, under this arrangement, it wouldn't have been a trek out into the wilderness. It would have been an expansion of, of what they already had there in terms of the paradise sanctuary of Eden, an expansion of it through multiplication, through the uh, subduing of the earth uh, until it assumes global proportions. And so what would characterize this period then would be the movement out from the focus. Here's the mountain of God, uh, the focus of Eden. And during this period, then there is the thrust out from Eden in all directions to, uh, to achieve the pleroma, hmm? the fullness, uh, uh, the, the predestined uh, the fullness of mankind, whatever the Lord would have had in mind. And so they would have multiplied, and then the Lord himself can determine when we have reached the fullness, when the, we have reached the pleroma. But meanwhile, then, there is this kind of a history of humankind in their first body, their atom body, their, their earthly bodies, their procreating uh, bodies which are adjusted to, to life <coughs> in these dimensions of reality that, uh, that we know. And so then the theme develops, as we said, of, of, of the city or the house of God, just as ways of, of uh, integrating, uh, giving a synthesis to what all of these uh, several cultural functions would add up to, they would add up to the uh, the building of, of uh, the house of, of, of God. And so cultural fullness, the achievement of that is what characterizes uh, the, this particular period. And then, as I say, the Lord will decide 
when we have reached the pleroma stage, then once again, the Holy Spirit, who is the active agent at each critical point of the creation of the world, the Holy Spirit, the Glory Spirit, creates man in his image up to, up to a, a point, as we've seen. And uh, at this point, it is uh, the Spirit of God uh, who would work that inward transformation from a condition of passe dicari, passe non dicari, into a condition of not able to sin and any more confirmed in everlasting uh, life. And so it would once again be that spirit of glory who would now work supernaturally, a supernatural and act as the original creation of, of man in the image of God, act supernaturally to effect that last stage, that last component in the image, which was physical. Uh, glorification and uh, that leads man into the eternal state which by the way has been there from the beginning okay <coughs> that, that upper register has existed all the time it isn't that that this eternal city of our uh, this eternal <coughs> state of affairs this upper register this heaven this consummation state it isn't that that is just produced uh, at, at this point in, in history, it's been there all the time. And uh, what it amounts to is that God affects a change in, in human beings so that they enter into and become incorporated <coughs> into, become a part of, of, of uh, that heavenly temple which has been there uh, right from uh, the uh, beginning of things. So uh, that's the way I'm trying to suggest here. And just to now look at a little bit of, of, of this and comment on it further. Let's turn back then in Kingdom Prologue to page 60. And I hope, by the way, that now you are making sure that you're reading through Kingdom Prologue and keeping ahead of us in class because we are uh, following pretty closely through Kingdom Prologue from uh, here on out. Uh, Well, let's see where to uh, pick this up. It's on pages 60, uh, 61, and, uh, and so on. Uh, maybe what I could uh, ask is if in, in your reading then, or in connection with this then, then uh, you have any uh, particular uh, questions at the bottom of page uh, 61, the point I was just making, that uh, heaven is this thing that's been there all the time, and it's God's achievement, not ours. Heaven is not a human achievement. It's not the end product of human culture. God created it in the beginning. Genesis 1 verse 1, and it requires a supernatural act of God to bring man into participation in the reality of heaven. The consummation of human earth history consists in the removal of man's limitation to the earthly, or positively, it consists in the transformation of man's perceptive capability and total experiential capacity with respect to the cosmos, whereby he can apprehend now the heavenly dimensions right now we of course are limited to, to the lower uh, uh, dimensions of the lower register and glorification is that which transforms us so that now we access the, uh, the, the cosmos including uh, its invisible dimensions and to be able to do that uh, it puts a, a whole new face on, on the whole cosmos as uh, perceived by us and so in effect it is it is uh, to uh, put a whole new face, it's to, it's to, to create uh, from, from the point of view of our experience a whole new world even though it's been there all the time for us now it becomes uh, something entirely uh, new. experiential capacity with respect to the cosmos whereby he can apprehend the heavenly dimensions and particularly the epiphanic glory which filling all gives to the whole from the perspective of human history the character of a new heavens and earth. Glorification by which man enters this Sabbath realm of glory is as much a supernatural act of God as the original act. Man's own historical cultural enterprise could uh, take him only so far. It could take him to the point of fullness that we call the, the big city, uh, megapolis, but it couldn't take him beyond megapolis. It's so the supernatural act of God is the only thing that can come to the Sabbath enthronement in which his dominion over the world under God is perfected. Now that tells us also if we're trying to develop sort of a Christian philosophy of culture, uh, how to look at uh, our, 
our uh, culture, and of course it hasn't developed in, in, in this particular way, and now it develops within the framework of a common grace principle and so on. But uh, in, in uh, either case, what we can do in terms of multiplying fillings of doing the earth, what we can do in terms of our cultural uh, and endeavors is not the real thing. Uh, the real thing is the divine culture that, that, that God produced, as I said back there in the beginning, and in which we enter, which we, we become a, a, a part of. What is our culture? Our culture, it is only a temporary substitute for the real thing. <laughs> The, the external aspects of our culture uh, do not enter into the consummation of, apart from ourselves. Huh? Uh, when we were talking about the cultural enterprise, we said that the production of man himself is the, the, the centerpiece of, of the whole thing. And so to that extent, in that we are producing the human beings uh, who will be a uh, part of this, we are uh, contributing something uh, to that eternal culture. And yet, our natures, as flesh and blood, we are told, cannot enter the, the, that, uh, even where we do make that contribution, our own selves, uh, uh, to the, the, the final uh, heavenly uh, reality. It is something that has to be completely transformed by the, the act of glorification to, to equip us for us. Meanwhile, then, our cultural products don't get there. They, they are just a temporary substitute and without this act of glorification we would never really be able to get to the ultimate point in fulfillment of the mandate and promise of God that we should be the ones who have dominion over all of the earth. We would be making cultural progress. We do make cultural progress all through this and we are amazed at the, the, the kind of things in <coughs> modern technology and so on is, is doing and yet is it not the fact that the more our technology advances and becomes the, 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 the instrument by which we uh, are able to exercise dominion over the world, the more that happens, the, the more we become dependent on our technology. Huh? And so, yes, it's marvelous that we can go out into space and into the depths of the sea, but we are completely dependent upon our technology uh, to, to do that. And uh, so what glorification does is it takes us beyond uh, this dependence upon technology and invests us with the capacities which are just integral and part of our very nature, and this, this new capacities, these new uh, capabilities and so on, so that without uh, having recourse to technical uh, <coughs> external paraphernalia and inventions, just in the integrity of what God has made us to be as glorified beings, we have now have complete dominion over the world as best exemplified in our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, who is the, uh, the, the second Adam and, 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 uh, and, and whose experience is, uh, is, is the first one. He is the first one to ascend to, to heaven on that Sabbath throne, as we were uh, speaking about the Sabbath and, and so on. But in the, the Lord Jesus Christ, then, we can see how he is one who, uh, without uh, uh, dependence on a spaceship, ascends in, into heaven. Uh, uh, he is one who, with, without uh, uh, boats, can, can walk on the water, and, and so on and so on, just to, you know, in, in terms of uh, his own uh, nature now. And, and uh, the, this is the, the picture that, you know, it surpasses anything in science fiction mm -hmm. uh, as to, to what can be achieved. And so here is uh, the God's uh, ultimate creature, the, the human one, uh, now with uh, the... The, the ultimate creaturely uh, dominion over the, the whole uh, creation. Can we move around with the, uh, at the speed of light or, or whatever in, in, in this future? I suppose we, we can. But uh, we will be completely beyond the, the need of our present cultural achievements, uh, uh, the purpose of culture to, to enhance our, our, our person, our royal majesty as uh, kings and queens uh, under God. Uh, but uh, we, we don't need uh, uh, beautiful as I saw all of your clothing uh, is here. Uh, we don't need these uh, burlap rags and we are garbed in life, do we? All right? So the, 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 the products of our culture are, are, are clothing to start with. Uh, you don't need when, 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 as I say, you are radiant uh, luminosity 
that you don't need the extension of your clothing in, in, in buildings uh, like this uh, because you are, are, are above the, the, the harm that the elements or anything else that it could, could do to you. Uh, you don't need uh, uh, vehicles to transport you around uh, the, the permit. You, you can move with, it with the speed of, of light or whatever. Uh, you don't need all of the technology for communication and transportation and the processing of information. Uh, just in what God makes you to be in glorification, uh, it, it gives you this ultimate dominion over uh, all of these things but by itself. Now that's the kind of biblical concept, as I say, that surpasses, I think, science fiction, and which is exemplified in the, the, the person of our Lord Jesus uh, Christ. We will see him. We will be uh, like him. And that will be the ultimate culture. That will be heaven. That will be Sabbath. That will be metapolis, the beyond city, not just big city, but beyond anything we can imagine. And, uh, and it's, uh, the, it's where God is, of course. And so in Ezekiel, he, he names his uh, city Yahweh, so the Lord is there. And that's the secret of it all, that the Lord is there. And we are before his face, and, and he is the secret and source of life. Yes. Um, towards the end of the 19th century, there was a, a predominant millennial view of post-millennial uh, will uh, we, we, uh, let that propaganda go, but go ahead. Well, anyway, yeah. but it, it, it seems that the, 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 the idea was, you know, particularly through the, the, the uh, great revival, is that we're on the verge of ushering in the kingdom. And then after the First World War, it seems to flip the other direction to a dispensational pessimism, because they tied so closely the advancement of culture with the advancement of the kingdom of God. You see that as a, as a time when you do that, you'll then judge the advancement of the kingdom of God by cultural advancement. What was your last point? Well, it, when World War One hit, the culture was then deemed as, as pessimistic with where you're destroying yourself. And so it switched to a, a dispensational premillennial pessimism as being the, uh, a more dominant view. Do you see that as a result of when you confuse culture with the kingdom of God? that you confuse the cultural advancement with kingdom advancement? Well, I, I suppose it's conceivable uh, that, that that could be the case. I just don't buy into all of that. The, the, these categories of pessimism and optimism, they're completely meaningless. Uh, and and uh, it's a question of, of exegetical reality. What, what does the Bible uh, predict? And, uh, and in, in terms of, uh, you know, you, you keep hearing from uh, the post mills, especially the theonomic post mills that anything that doesn't accept their uh, sort of optimistic view of, of, of mankind headed for a golden age even before the, the consummation, huh? That they think that anything that doesn't accept that is uh, is, is pessimistic. Uh, I'm on mill. Yeah, yeah, that, that, yeah, yeah, okay. But, but, uh, <laughs> so I'm in the biblical view, but uh, Darby, Darby, when he came to the state and was promoting dispensationalism, he couldn't understand why Americans weren't adapting to pessimism. They liked everything else, but they didn't like the pessimistic part. And that seemed to be a, 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 a drive behind dispensationalism was, was, this, was this pessimism. I don't know that's the, the drive behind particular views. It's a, a, it's a, uh, a judgment that you make may make about them. I, I think that uh, uh, the, the views are attempts to deal with the exegetical evidence. It, but the, uh, the millennial question I don't think necessarily uh, fits here. I would like to talk about eschatology at, at some point, which would include millennialism. I'm not quite sure how immediately relevant that is uh, right here. Well, for the, except for the millennial, being a form of dispensationalism, is they sort of uh, negate oftentimes the cultural mandate because they hey, it's all going to burn anyway. We're just waiting for the secret rapture, and so they don't see the need for a cultural mandate. Yeah, well, this, 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 is, this is so. So you end up with the fundamentalist reduction that, that Carl Henry spoke about a long time ago. Yeah, all right. And then on the other end, in politics, when you get people who have a triumphal view of, let's say, post-millennial, and they're involved in politics, they then seem to, seems to me anyway to equate the political agenda with the advancement of the kingdom, because we need to take over. Yeah, well, that, uh, this is true, and uh, and uh, in, in 
part uh, this fault can be attributed to our Kuiperian heritage, uh, too, insofar as the Kuiperian uh, uh, approach is to identify the whole cultural ent ent enterprise with uh, the kingdom. Now, that, that's more a, a subject uh, to deal with when we're under uh, the common grace culture rather than at this particular uh, one. So, uh, uh, the, I mean, the, the points you're raising are, 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 are important and so on, but I, I'm not quite seeing that this is the place to discuss them. If we can maybe bring them up again when we're talking about common grace, I think it would be uh, more appropriate. Well, let's uh, look back here now then. Uh, on page 63, after we have worked uh, through this uh, attempt to paint a, a picture of what the eschatological uh, structure of history would have been like, then we <coughs> move on to the threatened curse. And uh, actually, yesterday, we did already uh, deal with, uh, uh, with uh, that, the curse of death and the day you eat thereof, you will die. And we made the point that the uh, sanctions of this covenant were ultimate. There was heaven on the one side is the blessing sanction, and on the other <coughs> side, the threatened curse is actually the threat of hell. And so that the death that is spoken of here is not physical death, uh, uh, but it is uh, what, uh, after the entrance of physical death, it comes to be called the second death, namely uh, hell. A apart from uh, the fall and, and uh, the uh, entrance into the picture of physical death as the first death, uh, a death would have just been uh, hell itself. It wouldn't have been the second one. It would have been the on only one. Now, as a result of the fall and and uh, God's purposes, uh, the, then uh, the physical death uh, enters and performs certain functions uh, that we might think about, but we won't get into right now. But that becomes then the first death, and then after that, the lake of fire, the second, uh, the second death. And uh, it was that then that the covenant of creation curse uh, uh, sanctioned, uh, confronted man with as the option if he were disobedient. Now then, moving on and we, we come to something which was <coughs> fundamental to this whole thing. This, this whole process was one that was based on a probation. These two sanctions were the, the, the uh, alternative outcomes uh, of probation, successful or, or otherwise. And uh, so we should just look at that for a moment as, as something in, in itself. Uh, we have been arguing that this whole thing, of course, is a covenant of works. In fact, on the next page in your kingdom prologue or so, we, we actually come to a, a prolonged discussion of covenant of works, which now we will not have to go into here again because we did that extensively. A lot of you uh, talked all about it in uh, your exam question and so on. Uh, but let's just uh, say something further here to, about the, the fact of, of the probation. And um, why it was probation necessary? Well, given certain things that are given here, it, it is uh, necessary given that the, the Lord God is the holy God who cannot look upon sin and, and, and tolerate it. Given that he, he comes to man and, and gives him the, the, the Sabbath promise, namely that uh, he should come to the point where he had passed beyond uh, all uh, uncertainty and, uh, and whatnot and uh, enter in with God into his e e eternal uh, felicity and uh, the, the, the land of the eternal blessedness and so on, uh, never to be interrupted. G given those things, it, it now becomes necessary that there should be something done that would trigger a, a change in mankind so that he would no longer be in that state where he was able to fall into uh, to sin. Because you can see that it would be intolerable for a God <coughs> to uh, bring somebody uh, into a state of, of guaranteed sabbatical heaven blessedness forevermore, someone who might, after entering that, fall into sin. Uh, so that, that just could not be. God has to e effect a change uh, in this creature so that he is brought to a state of confirmed righteousness, uh, as we've been discussing it. And uh, so it was necessary that there should be a, a, a probation, a, a, a testing, a, a limited testing uh, that would uh, precipitate a, a, an ultimately de de decisive out outcome. And uh, this then is what God proceeded to do. So there had to be, in other words, man couldn't be 
under an eternal, never-ending conditionality, huh? where he, his, his being, uh, con continuing to be righteous was, was something that, that uh, might fail, that that couldn't be, he had to be brought beyond that kind of conditionality in, into a fixed state of righteousness. Now, how does God uh, do it? He, he in, intensifies the demands of, of the covenant, the, the general stipulations. He intensifies them and, and so brings the whole probationary the covenantal testing uh, to a, a head. And he does it by means of, of uh, two, two things. First, he, he introduces a special stipulation which was different than all of the others. The, the uh, one connected, of course, with the tree of, of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, an exceptional kind of thing, different than all of the other stipulations, both formally and in substance and in, in form. It's the one negative one, is it not? All of the other mandates of God under the covenant were positive. They were role-defining, function-defining uh, things that directed man on his way positively into the, uh, the, the world. Uh, but now there comes the negative instance, this, this that thou shalt not. So in form it is exceptional, and in the substance it is also exceptional, uh, because it takes one particular item out of the, the, the general category of, of uh, fruit trees. Huh? Fruit trees, which the Word of God itself has already defined as, as, as good for food and, and acceptable for food, and out of that general category, this new word of God takes one particular one and sets it aside as not for food. And so it's entirely uh, exceptional <coughs> to, to the order of things that's defined by, by God him, himself. And, uh, and, and what does this add up to? It means that man must be listening to and, and living by every word that comes out of the mouth of God, including this new word that has just come. Yes, there was the word of God that said trees are for food. But now here's another word, uh, an actual canonical, legitimate, authoritative word of God that says this is an exception. And you can see how this then would be calculated uh, to, to drive man to the point where there was no other ball game in town except this one, namely, will I submit myself to the authority of the word of God? It was a, a way then of, of sharpening that whole issue of, of obedience and covenantal uh, commitment so that there were no other issues at stake. You couldn't appeal to common sense or something else out, out there. It was only in terms of this word of God that they had to uh, live or die at this particular point. And then secondly, along with this exceptional uh, probationary prescription, the Lord intensifies the whole test of man's obedience so that it should be a, be a, a radical, decisive thing by injecting into the picture the presence of this alien uh, a super human uh, in, intelligence, this malignant evil one uh, who would be changing the probation into a temptation. You see, probation is a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, probation is something that, that God in introduces, and he doesn't set it there as a stumbling block over which they should fall. That's not the point of a probation. Uh, the, the probation was, uh, was an open door whereby man could advance from his original state into this new and better one, confirmation and last glorification. That's what probation was. It, uh, God's intention, of course, was, was, was good. It was an opportunity to advance. Satan injects the evil design and intent into it and changes the probation into a temptation. And so by means of these two things, the, the exceptional a uh, special probationary commandment connected with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and by the injecting of, of, of this challenge of, of Satan against not only the Lord's authority and Armageddon, but against his, his servant, by these means that God precipitated a, a, an ultimate uh, decision uh, which could, was to settle the case for humanity, which were all in Adam, uh, once there and, and uh, for all. And uh, involved then, of course, in that too was this, this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which we discussed a little bit on page 66 again, and we've, we've already uh, talked about it. So the, the particular means whereby this would all unfold would, would all be connected with a particular tree of forbidden fruit, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The knowing of good and evil, then, as we've already tried to suggest, I think, is uh, does not point to, to uh, some knowledge that man was going to acquire that he didn't have before. No. 
uh, man already knows from the beginning the difference between good and evil. If he didn't know the difference between good and evil, he wouldn't be, re wouldn't be held responsible one way or the other. He knows what is right, he knows what is wrong, he knows what is good and evil. It was not that through this tree he would acquire some new kind of knowledge he didn't have before. It, uh, this tree is the place where he's going to do something. It was uh, the place where he was going to use the knowledge of good and evil that he already had and, uh, and use it as the, the priest, the judge uh, on that scene uh, as a way of, of discerning good and evil in uh, this presence that, that entered into uh, God's sanctuary. The tree of the knowing of good and evil is the tree of discerning judicially between good and evil and the pronouncing of an a, uh, appropriate verdict when, when confronted by a situation that called for judgment and of course the coming of this was alerting him to the coming of Satan. And so the and, and and the way it works out of course is that Satan himself directs man's attention right away to this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Only as he does so of course he doesn't call man's attention uh, to what that tree called upon him to do, namely to judge Satan, but he called his attention to uh, uh, other supposed benefits that he could have by violating God's command and so on. But the, the tree of uh, the, the designation, the, the tree of the knowing of good and evil, then is one that actually describes a judicial function. And as I try to point out here, I guess I have some of the appropriate verses uh, there. And, uh, 2 Samuel 14, verses 17 and 20, and 1 Kings 3, verses 9 and 28, there on page 66. In, in these passages, we find that kind of formula used to describe uh, the king, David, Solomon, as uh, those who had to make judgments, like deciding between two women, who is the real mother of, of the, the child, and, and so on. And uh, as they do that, then someone will say to them, oh, you you are like God, or you are like the Malachia, but you are like the angel of God <coughs> in this particular respect of knowing between good and evil. Uh, you are the, the image bearer of, of the God of heaven who sits there in the divine council. You here are exercising that kind of dominion uh, on, on earth. So uh, thus the probation takes place, with this radical testing, and uh, which brings out, of course, uh, the basic principle that this was a, a, a covenant of works. And by obedience here, by accomplishing this one act of righteousness, that's pretty much what it was, wasn't it? Huh? It wasn't just that uh, in, in sort of a general way, continuously, that Adam and Eve must be maintaining some general morality and fulfilling the cultural mandate in depth. No. There was one focal act of righteousness, one probationary mission that they must accomplish, this warfare, this battle of Armageddon that they must fight. And as the reward for standing in God's name and winning that battle, then a stage of conferral would uh, proceed. Well, then, that principle of uh, works we we'll try to cover on the next several pages through the end of that particular chapter, and uh, I don't know that there's, uh, uh, we should take the time now since we have spent so much uh, time before uh, on dealing with uh, the whole struggle represented by the uh, Fuller School, uh, uh, which uh, rejects out of hand the idea of human merit, which of course is, is uh, foundational to the whole idea of a, of a works arrangement, is that there should be uh, human merit, and we've uh, discussed it. The, uh, you know, the radical fallacies that are in, in, involved in, in, uh, in that rejection of, of human merit and ultimately there's an undermining of the very uh, gospel because with uh, two atoms of steam uh, you, you have to carry over to the second atom whatever you're uh, going to be saying about the first atom and vice versa otherwise there isn't a parallel between the two that Paul is uh, that the uh, uh, there is, and so you have to be uh, prepared, of course, to recognize the presence of genuine merit in the active and passive obedience of Christ both, and, uh, and, and so forth. So uh, it was a, a covenant of, uh, of works. Unhappily, it resulted in rebellion against the Lord, and through the first Adam, then uh, the reign of sin and death entered into the, uh, the world. Now then, the response of God to their uh, well, first of all, the, the actual history of it. We turn here to page 74 and following up. 
in the actual way this worked out, uh, it didn't need to, 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 to this. And uh, therefore, the first thing that would take some doing was to uh, just uh, go, go through the account uh, of the uh, the breaking of the covenant, and I'm not going to do that. Uh, uh, you can read these uh, pages 74 and, and uh, so on. Uh, just to mention an item or, or two, perhaps. Uh, uh, the breaking of the covenant, uh, as we've said, involved the, 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 God's bringing uh, in, into the picture the, the, this alien figure, this challenging uh, figure of uh, Satan, and in the particular form of a serpent. So here we encounter one of those questions about the, the literal or symbolic nature of the Genesis narratives. And uh, in spite of the fact then that I see that the chronological uh, uh, data in Genesis 1 are, are, are figurative, my basic view, of course, of these early chapters of Genesis is that they are not just a, uh, some allegory or a metaphor, they are a historical text. And so the historical text can have figurative touches in them here and there, uh, but the, the uh, burden of proof is on the, the one I would say who uh, suggests that a particular item is to be understood figuratively because as, as a whole, that this is, uh, is uh, even with a figure of speech, it still uh, is an historical text. But all right, in the case of the days of Genesis, I think the typical in the analogy of scripture is that of the overwhelming uh, that, that uh, the, the that formula of closure, <coughs> this evening and this morning, day one, that formula that constitutes the, the, the framework of the thing, the physical evidence is overwhelming, that that has to be understood figuratively. And uh, so, fine. But now we come to another question here. Uh, should, should we believe in a, a literal speaking serpent? And I would say that in this case, there is no physical evidence that would uh, suggest that you take it any other way. Uh, the, the straightforward the historical uh, uh, narrative. It would only be if you reach the judgment that the account as a whole is just some extended metaphor or allegory that you'd be justified in taking the speaking serpent and the of the tree of knowledge and whatnot uh, as anything but uh, literal. And, and, and so I do. And, uh, and uh, what we have apparently is, you know, the, the Satan's options are limited. He can't do anything he wants. Uh, uh, when the, the, the demons who uh, had possessed the man want to do something, they have to get permission to do it uh, from Jesus to enter into the swine, huh? which is uh, that whole episode is one that a nice, provides a nice close parallel uh, to what we have uh, here. The uh, demons entering into subhuman creatures of, uh, of uh, this uh, kind. So Satan's uh, options are, are, are limited. Uh, I think of the prologue to Job, it isn't that uh, Satan can do whatever he uh, comes into his mind, he has to come, there was a day when the Son of God had gathered together, we read up there, and Satan is also in their midst, and, uh, and uh, this dog has to uh, get a, a lengthening of his uh, leash before he can do what he wants to do, and he has to go there before the heavenly tribunal and, and get that permission, his, his, his options are limited. On this occasion, the text tells us uh, as something or other as to why, within his limited options, he, he selected this one, this particular creature, and it suggests uh, that this creature was more subtle and so on than, than the other creatures of the earth. In its, in its form, in its mode of locomotion, it was, it was sinuous, it was subtle, uh, and, and so on. And, and Satan sees in, in the physical features of, of this particular creature that which was constitute a, a, an appropriate, a visible, a, a physical image of the, the kind of thing that he was up to in terms of, of his subtle, enticing, tempting, uh, deceptive uh, approach. And so uh, he, he selects uh, this particular one afterwards, of course, when God pronounces judgment on him, uh, God picks up on, on this image of the serpent, and, and God sees in the serpent some other features that are now a, uh, very appropriate uh, as, a, uh, as an image of the judgment that's about to come, come on Satan, not his, his mode of op uh, modus operandi, but the, the judgment that's going to come on, the, the serpent is not only subtle, and, and it's camouflaged as it were in its movement, but it's also is lonely. Huh? 
the goose and the dust, and, and uh, virtually eats the dust of death, and, uh, and the Lord sees his palm, he speaks himself this same serpent uh, that uh, uh, Satan had chosen in order to depict his uh, downfall. But I think then uh, that the biblical analogy, uh, the analogy of scripture, uh, requires of us to understand uh, this uh, serpent uh, as a literal uh, speaking uh, serpent, and of course it also demands that there's, there's more than just a serpent there. The scripture demands, of course, that uh, this uh, serpent is the, the agent of this superhuman, malignant, and uh, malicious, and, and intelligent uh, of Satan. The rest of the Bible takes it that way. When we um, look at Genesis 3.15 presently, uh, we will be looking at other passages of scripture, which, of course, identify Satan in terms of the the old uh, serpent, the old dragon, and so on. So, so Satan comes, the temptation and fall uh, proceed. As I say, I won't take the time now here to repeat the analysis of his strategy and tactics and, and so on. Please read that for yourself. And uh, the, the result is that he is uh, highly successful in, in his mission in, in uh, analyzing what is going on uh, I think we should be aware that there are several sins of omission.